Okay, uh, welcome. What I'm going to do in this uh, video is walk through about seven different examples from the book of fallacies, sort of talk them through a little bit. And I'm going to go into a lot of detail, just sort of show you all the different ways you might think about these, and hopefully it'll be a little bit helpful. In general, don't just look at a, at a argument and say, oh, look, there's something emotional. It must be an appeal to emotion, or there's somebody authoritative. It must be an appeal to authority. Think about whether the things you see are irrelevant to the argument or not. So you, you have to do the same thing as always. You have to think about the argument and what is the reason for what's being said, and is that a good reason? Um, also, I'm going to ask for some of these. Would anything fix the argument afterwards? Um, anyway, let's start. I'm going to start with number two. It says this, Nietzsche was personally more philosophical than his philosophy. His talk about power, harshness, and superb immorality was the hobby of a harmless young scholar and constitutional invalid. And this is by another philosopher named George Santayana. Okay, so Nietzsche was a philosopher. He is very famous for having a, a, a sort of a, a startling philosophy. He said that kindness and, and mercy and things like that were just weak and were wrong, and we should just throw away morality and be ruthless. So he talks a lot about power and might makes right and being ruthless, and he talks about it very approvingly. Um, and Santayana here is introducing a very interesting historical fact. He says that Nietzsche himself wasn't like that at all. He was just a harmless young scholar and a constitutional invalid. He wasn't strong. He was unhealthy. So this is interesting. Um, now, is it a fallacy? Well, it partly depends on what Santayana is arguing for. So that's his premise. His premise is that this is the way Nietzsche was personally. He was harmless and, and, and invalid. Uh, so what's the conclusion? Well, it sort of depends on what you think the conclusion is, whether you'll say this is a fallacy or not. I'm not sure that in these sentences right here, there really is a conclusion. I think he's just giving you that fact. But I suspect that if you go back and read the source and read what he was saying, that he meant something more. What he meant is shown a little bit in the connotation here. I think what he's implying is that we should we don't have to pay any attention to Nietzsche's philosophy, that it's not really worth um, worrying about. You can see that because he says things like it was a hobby and it was he was a harmless young scholar. He's saying he was so he's basically saying, look, Nietzsche didn't live by his philosophy at all. We can dismiss it. We don't have to pay any attention to it. So is that a good argument? Well, the conclusion, if that's correct, the conclusion is that we shouldn't pay any attention to Nietzsche's philosophy, that it's it's not important. And the premise is that Nietzsche himself was a harmless young scholar and an invalid. He didn't live by his philosophy. So does the one have anything to do with the other? Probably not. It probably doesn't matter how Nietzsche lived, whether his philosophy itself was a good philosophy. So what, what Santayana is doing is he's taking the kind of person Nietzsche was and using that to disqualify the arguments that Nietzsche was making when they have nothing to do with each other. So this is, I think, a really clear example of the fallacy of attacking the person, or the fallacy of ad hominem. Um, let me see if there's something else I wanted to say about it. Oh, yeah, could this be repaired? Or would there be a time when this wouldn't be a fallacy? Well, if you could connect Nietzsche's personality and his lifestyle to his philosophy in some way. If you could show that his not being the way he talked about somehow implicated his philosophy, then it might be a reasonable argument. So for example, if you said this, if you said Nietzsche's philosophy, although it may sound good, is impossible to live by. And then you said, as a premise, even Nietzsche himself didn't live the way he talked. He was actually just a harmless young scholar. Then you could say that is one reason to think that if even the author didn't live by that philosophy, that nobody else can really either. But that would be a very different argument. You wouldn't be arguing that Nietzsche's philosophy was wrong. You'd be arguing that it was impractical. And then it would have something to do with that, that conclusion to ask whether Nietzsche himself lived by it. But that's not what Santayana is doing. He's just saying Nietzsche didn't live by it. Therefore, the philosophy is harm is, is, uh, can be dismissed. And that's just an argument ad hominem. It's a fallacy. Number three, like an armed warrior, like a plumed knight, James G. Blaine marched down the halls of the American Congress and threw his shining lances full and fair against the brazen foreheads of every defamer of his country and maligner of its honor. For the Republican Party to desert this gallant man now is worse than if an army should desert the general upon the field of battle. All right, so what's this talking about? James Blaine was apparently a congressman in 1876 and he was running, he wanted to run for president. And Ingersoll was making this speech at the National Convention to say, let's nominate him. 
So it doesn't directly say it here, but the conclusion is we should nominate James G. Blaine for president. Okay. And Ingersoll does two things. In the first line, he uses a lot of emotive language. Emotive language is language that really triggers the emotions. So he talks about him being a warrior and a knight and shining, throwing his shining lances and about all the defamers of the country and maligners of its honor, the people who are the enemies. He really paints this emotional picture to make you feel how noble James G. Blaine is. In the second line, he also paints an emotional picture, but he does something else. He actually gives an argument in the second line. He says, for the Republican Party to desert this gallant man now is worse than if an army should desert their general upon the field of battle. Now that's called an argument by analogy. What he's saying is that it would be wrong for a general to be deserted by his army. So in the same way, it would be wrong for Blaine to be deserted by or not nominating him. So that's an argument, but it's a kind of a weak argument. The reason it's a weak argument is because for it to work, you'd have to show several things. First of all, you'd have to convince people that James G. Blaine is like a general. Is, is he really like a general on the field of battle? You'd have to show that you'd have to, people would ask, well, isn't he just a congressman? Uh, is his life really in danger? A general puts his life in danger. Is he really in charge of heading the troops or is he just one more congressman? Um, was he a military strategist or something like that? I mean, why do we think of him like a general? Why should he be anything like a general? And even more importantly, you'd have to convince people that not nominating Blaine was like deserting a general. And that's a hard sell. I mean, people might want to say, wait a minute, um, if you desert a general, he's likely to die. But Blaine is not going to die if we desert him. Or if you desert a general, um, you're leaving him to lose the battle. But we're not necessarily going to lose the battle if we don't nominate Blaine. Or when you desert a general, you're breaking your oath. You're supposed to stay there with the rest of you, with the rest of your troops and, and fight together. But we've made no promise to Blaine to nominate him. That's never been part of this. So there's a lot of reasons why people might say this analogy doesn't work. You don't know, you haven't convinced us that Blaine is anything like a general, and you haven't convinced us that not nominating him is anything like deserting a general. So what you need for this argument is to show that the analogy fits. You need to show that Blaine is like a general. You need to show that not nominating him is like deserting him. And that's where the first sentence comes in. Ingersoll wants to convince us of that. So what does he do? Well, he doesn't give us reasons. He just simply gives us this emotional language. He paints a picture of Blaine as a, as a knight, as a warrior, of fighting nobly and honorably, and, and then says, don't you feel how wrong it would be to desert, to desert him? So if you think about it, he doesn't give reasons at all for thinking that, that this analogy works. He just gives an emotional appeal. This is definitely a fallacy of appeal to emotion. And again, it's not just because there is emotion, it's because he uses the emotion to detract from the arguments he needs to make, which is to show us that this really is something like the general on the field of battle. All right, I'm not sure if there's a good way to repair this one. I will move on. The next one I want to look at is number 13. All right, a national organization called In Defense of Animals registered protest in 1996 against alleged cruelty to animals being sold live or slaughtered in Chinese markets in San Francisco. Patricia Briggs, who brought the complaint to the animals, city's Animal Welfare Commission, said the time of the crustaceans is coming. You'd think people wouldn't care about lobsters because they aren't cuddly and fuzzy and they have these vacant looks and they don't vocalize. But you'd be surprised how many people care. To which response was given by Estella Kung, proprietor of Minky Game Birds, where fowl are sold live. How about the homeless people? Why don't the animal people use their energy to care for those people? They have no homes. They're hungry. All right. So let's see. The situation is that there were these Chinese markets in San Francisco where people could buy live lobsters or maybe buy lobsters and then they would be slaughtered right there and they'd take them home to cook. And uh, In Defense of Animals was, a, was an organization that was protesting this as, and saying it was animal cruelty. And so they brought this to the Animal Welfare Commission. So there's three groups involved. There's the Animal Welfare Commission, which is making the decision. And then there's Patricia Briggs representing the In Defense of Animals group, arguing that they should not allow lobsters to be slaughtered like this. And there's Estella Kung, who's one of the um, proprietors, one of the shop owners, arguing that they should allow lobsters to be sold like this. And uh, so there are these three different groups. Now, uh, Patricia Briggs makes, her, makes the first argument. Kung makes the second one. Briggs's argument is already maybe a fallacy. We'll take a little bit look at it, a little bit of a look at it. But Kung's argument is, is completely a fallacy. All right, so let's look at Briggs' argument first. 
She says the time of the crustaceans is coming. You'd think people wouldn't care about lobsters because they aren't cuddly and fuzzy and they have these vacant looks and they don't vocalize. She's saying they're not like puppies or kittens or something. People don't automatically feel for them. But you'd be surprised how many people care. She says even though they're not, you know, all these cuddly animals, people still do care about what's happening to the lobsters. They don't want us to mistreat them. All right. One student, uh, I had some students one year who thought that this was an appeal to emotion because she talks about them being cuddly and fuzzy and so on. But actually, it's the exact opposite here. She's not saying, look, don't you feel bad for these lobsters at how cuddly and fuzzy they are? She's saying, actually, the lobsters don't have a lot to make you feel emotional about them. She's saying they're not cuddly, they're not fuzzy, they don't vocalize. So she's saying, if anything, there's not a strong emotional reason to be for the lobsters. And then she's saying, but people care anyway, not because of their emotion, but in spite of the fact that there's no emotional connection. So this is actually not directly an appeal to emotion. What she is saying is, even though they don't feel it, people st still do care about the lobsters. And she also says the time of the crustaceans is coming. So this is the second question. What, is, is this relevant? And the question is, it depends on what she's arguing. My first thought is that she was arguing for the right of lobsters to not be sold live or slaughtered. The right of lobsters not to suffer this and that it was some, somehow too cruel for them. And then I was thinking, but this is irrelevant. It doesn't, if, if lobsters, if it's, if lobsters have a right to be treated humanely and that means not being sold or slaughtered in these markets, then it, then they have that right regardless of how many people care. It doesn't matter whether people care or not, that's still the right thing to do. It doesn't matter if the time of the crustaceans is coming or not, that's still the right thing to do. And it doesn't make any difference if people care a lot. That would just be a fallacy of appeal to the populace. Hey, a lot of people think this, so it's true. And that doesn't make any sense. Uh, that would be a fallacy. But I don't think that's actually what's going on. I don't think Briggs is committing a fallacy. I think what she's doing is this. I don't think she's arguing that the commission should care about the lobsters. I think that she's arguing that the commission should realize that other people care about the lobsters and that they should do the politically prudent thing. I think she's saying to them, do you want to be on the good side of your constituents? Do you want people to approve of what you've done? Do you want them to vote for you the next time you are running for office? Or do you want them to, to uh, treat you well in the press or whatever the situation was politically? She's saying then you should realize a lot of people care about the lobsters. So I think she's saying you should be politically aware that there are consequences if you go the wrong way. So my next thought is maybe that's an appeal to force. Maybe instead of giving a reason to care about the lobsters, she's just threatening them. But actually, again, it depends on what the conclusion is. If her conclusion is lobsters have a right to be taken care of, then this would be an appeal to force. It, wouldn't, it would be irrelevant. Who cares whether it's good or bad for you to vote for this? It has nothing to do with whether it's the right thing to do. But if she's just simply talking about what the politically wise thing to do is, then it's not an appeal to force. It's a straightforward argument saying you need to realize a lot of people care. And when she says the time of the crustaceans is coming, I think she means you don't want to be on the wrong side of history. When people look back, you want them to look back and say, what a good decision this commission made. So she's actually, interestingly, not arguing on the behalf of the lobsters, or at least that's not the conclusion she's pushing for. She's just arguing that it's the prudent thing for them to approve this or to, to stop this practice. Okay, I don't know. You can maybe read that differently. But the interesting thing that I want to focus on, and the reason it's in the textbook, is the last is the response by Kung who says, how about the homeless people? Why don't the animal people use their energy to care for those people? They have no homes, they're hungry. Now, that might be true, that there were a lot of homeless people that were hungry with no homes who needed to be cared for. It's probably not, it, it might be true that the animal, I'm sure it was true that the animal people were not spending as much time on the homeless people as they were on the animal rights issue because that was what they were there for. And this after all was an animal welfare commission, that was what it was there to decide. But regardless, it's irrelevant. It doesn't make any difference about the homeless people to the lobsters. It makes a lot of difference to the homeless people, but not to the lobsters. And the question at issue is not about the homeless. The question at issue is about the lobsters. So this is a classic example of a red herring. Um, uh, Kung is just bringing this issue up. It has nothing to do with the argument they're worrying, worrying about. She's bringing it up to distract people from thinking about lobsters. She's saying, let's talk about homeless people instead, and then trying to get people riled up about that because it's just, it's just a distraction. So this is an example of a red herring fallacy. I don't really know how you can fix that one. It seems pretty clearly um, uh, irrelevant. All right, next I'm gonna to go to page 138. Give me a second to find that page.
Oh, it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't go there right away. So give me a second to actually find it just by scrolling through. Did I miss it? Nope, here it is. Okay, here we go. 138, number one. Let's take a look at this one. This person says, Frank Webster says, my generation was taught about the dangers of social diseases. He means um, sexually contracted diseases, sexually transmitted diseases, STDs, how they were contracted and the value of abstinence. Our schools did not teach us about contraception. They didn't pass out condoms as many of today's schools do. And not one of the girls in any of my classes, not even in college, became pregnant out of wedlock. It wasn't when people began teaching the children about contraceptives that our problems with pregnancy began. All right, so he's arguing, his, his implied conclusion is that we shouldn't um, teach people about, we shouldn't have sex ed that teaches people about contraceptives or hands them out. And that if we do, at least, actually that's sort of his eventual uh, statement. But for now, he's just saying that doing that causes more problems with pregnancy than it solves. Um, all right, the first thing about this is, this argument isn't complete nonsense. It is relevant. It's just not relevant enough. So this isn't a fallacy of irrelevance. It's not something where the argument has nothing to do with the conclusion. The problem is it's, it's, a, a, it's a problem of defective induction. In other words, there's just not enough here. His case isn't strong enough. He could make it stronger with some other things if he brought them in, but he hasn't here. At least maybe he could. It depends on what's out there. Um, so his basic argument is, look, we, for a while, we had no teaching about or providing, providing of contraceptives, and we had no pregnancy out of wedlock. And then later, we had a lot of teaching about contraceptives, and we provided them, and now we have a lot of pregnancy out of wedlock. So clearly, one caused the other. There's two issues here, and they're closely related. One is this is a kind of an anecdotal fallacy. And the second one, which is where I really want to focus, is there's a false cause fallacy here. So the anecdotal fallacy is, is uh, what the book calls hasty generalization. The problem with anecdotes, there's a couple of problems. One is, uh, one is that you can't be sure with an anecdote that it's really been properly analyzed because it hasn't been done scientifically. And so he may say, for example, oh, I'm sure that none of these people had uh, got pregnant uh, even in college. But in fact, that may not be true at all. It might be that they became pregnant and he doesn't know about it, that they had an abortion or that they uh, just left the school or, or something like that. And he doesn't realize how much there was. So. First of all, it's unlikely that he really knows whether people got pregnant out of wedlock. It may just be a lot more public now. And if you'd done this, if this had been a scientific study, that kind of thing would have been properly taken care of. But that's not the real danger or the main danger of anecdotal stuff. The main danger of anecdotes is that they're hasty generalization. In other words, somebody says, this is my experience, so it must be everybody's experience. And the difficulty here, I suppose, could be that maybe it's just in his circle that this coincidentally happened to go this way. Maybe he just by coincidence was with a group of people that didn't, um, didn't uh, get pregnant out of wedlock. And other pe places in the nation, uh, coincidentally, people did. And that has nothing to do with uh, the, the sex ed. So that's possible. And the problem here, the fallacy there, is to take a single example or a single set of examples like this and then generalize and assume that it's a general rule for the whole society. And that might not be the case. That doesn't make this argument valueless. It just means that it would need a lot to be strengthened a lot. You'd repair it by actually doing a study and finding out whether that was true in general and whether it was true more than just in this area. Okay. But there's a, a more important thing here, and that's the causation correlation question. This is the fallacy of false cause. Because see, he could be he could be right about this. He could be right that in his day they didn't teach about contraception and they didn't get pregnant very much, and that in our day we teach a lot more about contraception and we do get pregnant a lot more. But it doesn't necessarily mean that one caused the other. For example, this is maybe not that likely, but it's possible that it happened the other way around. That as people begin to get pregnant out of wedlock a whole lot more, that's when sex ed programs begin to try to hand out contraception. And it could be that it was the pregnancy that caused the contraception and not the other way around. But even more likely, it could be that both of these things didn't cause each other, but they were both caused by the changes in society from the 50s to the 60s. Because from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s, there were a lot of changes in society and a lot of things, uh, uh, and that may have led to both the changes in how what we did for sex ed and the changes in how many people became pregnant out of wedlock. Um, so. 
Again, this isn't valueless. You could fix this argument if you would address those questions. If you'd find a way to show that one thing really did cause the other, and if you find a way to show that it was general, it might be a worthwhile argument. Um, whether you could find those things is another question. You'd have to actually start looking and seeing which side the data uh, uh, favors. But as it stands, it's not strong enough. It's a fallacy of defective induction. All right, next, um, I'm gonna go to page 151. So again, give me a second while I scroll through to find it. All right, I wanna look at number four. Order is indispensable to justice because justice can be achieved only by means of a social and legal order. This is from a, something on punishing criminals. So he's apparently talking about why we need punishment in order to have justice. Probably people were saying it's not fair to punish people or it's not just. And uh, he was saying, yes, it is. Orders are indispensable to justice because justice can be achieved only by means of a social and legal order. All right. Um, the way it's phrased, just right here, there's clearly a fallacy. I'm going to defend it just a little bit later on, but I think right here it's clearly a fallacy. And what is that fallacy? Well, what's the conclusion? The conclusion is order is indispensable to justice. In other words, you need order to get justice. And what's the premise? Justice can be achieved only by means of a social and legal order. In other words, you need order to get justice. So basically, what he's saying is, you need order to get justice. Why? Because you need order to get justice. He's just repeating the conclusion in the premise. The because there isn't a reason is just a restatement of the conclusion, at least as it stands right here. So this is an example of begging the question. Now, could it be fixed? Well, to be fixed, fix it as it stands, you'd have to actually give a different reason. You couldn't use the conclusion. I will say that we don't have enough context here, and it's possible that this is not um, begging the question. It all depends on what he means by indispensable. If order is indispensable to justice means we have to have order to have justice, then it's just begging the question because that's what he says next. But I think it's possible that he meant this, that he was sa he was saying punishment is, is, is important for justice, and people were saying, Justice has nothing to do with punishment. And he was saying, but law and order needs it. You need it for law and order. And they were saying, yeah, but law and order has nothing to do with, with justice either. And he was saying, well, law and order should be part of the definition of justice because you need the law and order to get justice. And in that case, there would be two different parts. The premise would be you need law and order to get justice. And the conclusion would be, therefore, we should define law and order as being an important part of justice. And that would be a reasonable argument. You would be making one from, on the basis of the other. So is this a fallacy? You have to go read the context to see what was really being said. Uh, but if indispensable to justice means you need it to get justice, then this is definitely begging the question. Okay, next. Um... Number 11. Okay, yeah, 11's down here. Consider genetically engineered fish. Now, now before we go on, look at the title of the source. It's genetic engineering needs strict regulation. So you know what this guy's arguing for. He's arguing that we should regulate genetic engineering. And he says this, consider genetically engineered fish. Scientists hope the fish that contain new growth hormones will grow bigger and faster than normal fish. Other scientists are developing fish that could be introduced in cold, into cold northern waters where they cannot no, now survive. The intention for both of these is to boost fish product production for food. So you could save, perhaps, a lot of people's lives this way. The economic benefits may be obvious, but not the risks. Does this make the risks reasonable? All right, so what's going on here? Um, well, f first note that he does something interesting. He's arguing that we need to regulate it, but he starts by talking for like two, two, two or three sentences about the benefits of genetically engineered fish. So what he's doing is setting up a kind of an Iron Man argument. That is, he's trying to take his opponent's strongest argument. And that's a good thing. That's really a nice technique here. He's saying, before I start telling you why I think we should regulate this, let me acknowledge the arguments for it, which is that this could really help uh, boost food and there, there may be many economic benefits. So he does that right away so that you don't think he's forgotten that. And so people on the other side can't say, yeah, but it'll be a benefit. He'll say, I already said that, I knew that. What he's saying is that in addition to that, there are also risks. And we know what the benefits are, we don't know what the risks are. And then he asks this question, does this make the risks reasonable? So that's the second thing I want you to notice. He asks a question at the end, but I don't think he really means it as a question. I think he may mean, we'd have to read further. I suspect he means it as a rhetorical question. In other words, he thinks the answer is no. It does not make the risks reasonable. 
So what he's saying is, we don't know what the risks are, but that doesn't make them reasonable. So the question is, is this a fallacy? Is he right in arguing? What he's doing, he's arguing that we don't know what the risks are. They're not obvious. And he's arguing from that, that therefore it's not, they're not reasonable for us to take, and without regulation at least. So is that a fallacy? Well, it sort of, again, depends on what he's saying. If he were saying, we don't know what the risks are, therefore it is too risky, that would be a kind of an argument from ignorance. Just knowing that, just that we don't know what the risks are doesn't mean there will be risk. It doesn't prove there will be risk. So if he's saying the risks are unreasonable because they are great, then he's definitely jumping to a conclusion here that he has no right to jump to. And this is the fallacy of ignorance, of appeal to ignorance. But if he's saying we don't know what the risks are, so we can't be sure there are none, it's not necessarily true that they are reasonable. Notice he doesn't say they're, that we know they're bad. He just says it doesn't make them reasonable. If all he's saying is we don't know what the risks are, so we can't be sure they're reasonable, then that's a completely legitimate conclusion to draw. And in fact, at the other side, if they say, ah, oh, we don't know any risks, they're probably fine. He can say, now you're committing the fallacy of appeal to ignorance because, or the argument from ignorance. He says, you're arguing from the fact that we don't know that there are any, so therefore there aren't. And you shouldn't do that. So this is a little tricky. I'm not sure it's a fallacy at all. It all depends. The trick here is to remember that if we don't know something, you just simply can't conclude much about it. You can't conclude that the risks are here. You can't conclude that they're not here. All you can conclude is that we don't know. So if he's saying we don't know if the risks are good, this doesn't make them reasonable. We just simply don't know. Therefore, let's regulate just in case. I don't think that's a fallacy. But if he's implying and goes on to imply that there are lots of risks, if he just in the next paragraph says, since there's so many risks, then he's, he's slipped one by you and he's tried to appeal to ignorance as an argument for the risks. And that would be a fallacy. Um, the last one I want to look at is a very interesting example of sort of an odd one. It's number 16. Mysticism, it says, is one of the great forces of the world's history. For religion is nearly the most important thing in the world, and religion never remains for long altogether untouched by mysticism. All right. So first of all, by religion and mis by mysticism, what do they mean? Well, by religion, they mean an organized set of beliefs and practices, some sort of organized religion. By mysticism, they mean when people have mystical experiences, when they feel like they've seen God or, or had a vision or something like that. And what he's saying is that mysticism, these kinds of mystical experiences or beliefs about mystical experiences, that kind of thing, that's really important because it's part of religion and religion is really important. Okay. So let's talk about the two premises first. Premise number one is that religion is nearly the most important thing in the world. Now you might disagree with that premise. And if you do, that doesn't make this a, a fallacious argument. It just makes it an argument where you disagree with the premise. You just think that the premise is wrong. Um, and the second premise is religion never remains for long altogether untouched by mysticism. You may not agree with that either. You may think there's lots of religions that don't have any mystical thing at all. They're all just about organized creeds and, and behaviors. And um, so in that case, you might disagree with his argument, but it doesn't make it a fallacy. It simply makes it an argument that you don't agree with the premises for. So the question is, suppose the premises were true. Suppose you agreed that religion is nearly the most important thing in the world, and you agreed that every time you have religion, sooner or later, not, too, not very long afterwards, it becomes uh, mystical at some level. Some, somebody brings mysticism into it. Would that mean that mysticism was also really important? And the answer is, no, it wouldn't. That's not enough. Just because religion is important doesn't mean that every part of religion is important. Maybe religion is important because of the organized part. Maybe the mystical part of religion is one part of it that's not important at all. We don't know that, and that hasn't been argued. So this by itself is a fallacy. It doesn't say enough. To make this argument, to repair it, you'd have to show that mysticism is not only part of religion, but that it's an important part of religion. And that's not been shown yet. And uh, so what this is, interestingly, is the fallacy of division. We're assuming that something is true about the whole and trying to conclude that it's true about one of the parts. We're assuming that it's true of the whole religion, that it's really important, and then trying to conclude that it must be true about a part of it, mysticism. But we don't necessarily know that. Something could be true about the whole thing because, for other, because of other reasons, and yet still not be true of mysticism. Okay, I don't know whether this will be helpful or not. I tried to just pick several different, very different ones that we could talk about a little bit and sort of walk you through it. 
um, I will see you next week.